Hello, this is Lady Tahila from the Coven of the Open Mind, and you're watching Wicca and Witchcraft 101. Hail and welcome. Today we are talking about Lecture 3, and that will be the beginning of Wiccan belief, actually most of the beliefs that are decidedly Wiccan. And next lecture we talk mostly just about the Wheel of the Year, which is the holidays and the traditions. And this one we're talking more about the particulars of what most Wiccans actually believe in when it comes to higher consciousness, higher power. We'll be talking a little bit about Kabbalah, just tying some of those things we mentioned in past times into this uh, context of framing it within the Wiccan context. Um, and then we'll move on to talking about witchcraft and really just from here, the lectures get more and more fun and the exercises get more and more fun. So um, that's why I just cover the Kabbalah and the deity stuff first, and then we can <laughs> put that behind us and work on our own relationship with these concepts. So what do Wiccans believe? <laughs> Wiccans believe in the Wiccan read. They believe in triform deity, duality of deity, aspects of deity is really what cardinality and, pol and polarity refer to. And we'll tie all of that together and talk about aspects when we talk about the prism principle, um, the great right, uh, and conception as a metaphor for manifestation, um, the threefold law, so the idea that there are consequences to your actions, and reincarnation. Uh, and specifically in Wicca, usually we refer to our willing desire to live in the life we live in so that we can learn whatever lessons we'd like to learn for our soul's sake or give back to the world in some sake. But that idea that you live many lives uh, and that it's a choice how you come to be in this world is all Wiccan beliefs. So in the Wiccan religion, uh, we uphold what is called the Wiccan reed. A reed is a statement of advice or counsel uh, it is, um, in this case, a group statement on the way that Wiccans conduct themselves, generally speaking. There are many interpretations of it. In Wicca, it is meant to be interpreted. Part of being an empowered being means that everything you do makes sense to you. <laughs> and so uh, in Wicca, we believe that you should have an understanding of everything and that everything is up to interpretation. In Wicca, there's no central authority to enforce any kind of adherence to any kind of rules. So within one lineage to the next, within one coven to the next, you may find some kind of enforcement where they're like, okay, you have to show up to meetings, you have to not be an a-hole, whatever. But in across all the groups, <laughs> In the greater scheme uh, of Wiccan philosophy, there's no real one way to interpret this or to conduct yourself, which is part of why Wicca is such a diverse religion. Uh, it's really an open tradition, you know, that people are meant to become a part of in their own way. Uh, and that goes right down into the literature from the classic authors, many of which we reference in this uh, lecture and that you would read uh, their words for yourself if you do the further reading that's in the book or that on the course website. So what is the Wiccan read? The Wiccan read is a set of eight lines. Uh, it has a rich history and there's many forms of it. You'll see different versions of it. This is the most common form. Uh, some will replace the word Wiccan with witches and still live by this without believing in the rest of Wicca. Some will pronounce the Wicca as Wicca, which is uh, like an older world pronunciation. And uh, all of those things are still correct. They're just different variations of the same thing here. Mm -hmm. This is the most common. It says, bide the witch's law ye must in perfect love and perfect trust. Eight words the Wiccan read fulfill, and it harm none, do as ye will. Lest in self-defense it be, ever mind the rule of three. Follow this in mind and heart, and marry ye meet, and marry ye part. Now, the first thing to keep in mind is that many people will swap the and with an old English archaic conjunction an, a-n, and that really means if. And that will change how you interpret what these words mean, which we'll see in a moment. So this is the most common form, but you'll also see many versions that have and, it harm none, do as ye will. Uh, many will say and Mary meet and Mary part without the D, right? And that kind of means something different. We'll talk about that. First, I wanted to talk a little bit about 
the history of the reed. So the Wiccan reed has its roots in the romantic uh, modern literature that was being written mostly in the 1800s that romanticized witchcraft. And we'll talk about that evolution of witchcraft through that period when we get to the um, chapter eight and talk about the history of witchcraft. Um, but the only part of the history that's really relevant now is to understand where this reed came from. The idea of empowerment, the idea that the witches were not evil beings who consorted with the devil. They were just women who did not always adhere to this idea that they should not take matters into their own hands. They knew the wisdom of the earth. They were midwives. They were healers. And when we look back historically, it's not just women who did these things. There were many people who were from the proto-Celtic cultures that had descended from ancient lines of Celtic peoples, uh, Druids and the like, who had an equal balance of male and female uh, spiritual leadership. Uh, it was very diverse. There was different tribes that I don't know if they would have called themselves tribes or clans or what terminology, but they were demonized. They were demonized throughout the witch hunt era. That philosophy was demonized because it was not Christian. It was, you know, take matters into your own hands. That's a path of power that can be dangerous. That's correct. But the level of hysteria that came about it was uh, largely driven by propaganda and uh, lots of political maneuverings and things that are interesting only in the context of the history chapter to come. As it relates to the subject of the reed, the first time you see anyone talking about doing what pleases you and not considering uh, an objective higher morality as in relation to your every action, that mentality was first written down by this French philosopher, Pierre Louis, in 1901, and he wrote, Ne nuit à ton voisin, c'est si bien compris, fais ce qui te plaît. And that roughly translates to uh, keeping in mind the needs of your neighbors, right? Um, you know, keeping this in mind, uh, do what pleases you, right? All that matters, really, is that you don't hurt the people around you. And this is a very utilitarian mindset. So you also see utilitarian philosophers and other people writing about this in other parts of the world. But this is the most uh, poetic version. Let's call it. This is the one that was uh, in the romantic phrasings of the French authors of the time. Many of those French authors were writing explicitly about witchcraft and romanticizing the witch hunt era and the witches of the time. And later you see other people adapting the same ideology, stating, we are empowered, our will matters. And you see Aleister Crowley in 1904. He's largely credited, he's largely credited with the foundation of Satanism and chaotic magic and like the whole path of power that we see today sort of stems from his um, uh, largely hermetic teachings in the early 1900s. And he phrased it as, do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And that's the, the foundation of those left-handed paths that later have come from that. Gerald Gardner, he was in these same hermetic circles, largely hanging out with a lot of the same people, probably interacted with Crowley directly. Um, at, at, at some times during his life, he was an anthropologist. He was in love with Middle Eastern culture, with Kabbalah. A lot of them were in love with ancient Jewish mythology and, and mysticism. So, you know, we get this very hermetic foundation to Wicca. It's largely driven by Kabbalah, but it's without the Jewish undertones, without the dogma. Uh, and he phrased it as, do what you like as long as you harm no one. And you see a similar phrasing going back to um, uh, in his earliest, in, G in Gerald Gardner's earliest writings about this philosophy, you see similar phrasing going back to Pierre Louis and this idea that, yes, do as you wilt, but also try to minimize the damage of that as well, because what other people will matters too. Then uh, he meets uh, Doreen Valiant and she joins his coven and she becomes the mother of modern witchcraft. And, uh, you know, she gets along with him very well at first, but later they had a divergency. Uh, but basically she was the poet. She was the, uh, the one who had a way with words. He, Gerald Gardner, rambles and uh, is not very organized in his writing. It's, his writing's very difficult to get through. That's why there's not too much of like his original writing. It's also very... Um, lacking in the modern standards for like academic uh, uh, authenticity, <laughs> let's call that. Uh, so 
you know, Doreen Valiant came along and she really had a better understanding of like, okay, how do we need to be saying this? How do we need to be representing this? Um, let's, it matters how you say things. Words have power, right? So that's why he's the father, she's the mother. And we needed them both because with Wicca, we believe in balance, right? So Doreen Valiant was Gerald Gardner's woman. <laughs> she was his high priestess. Uh, she took all of his teachings and all of his rituals and rewrote them. And that is what you largely see in the Gardnerian Book of Shadows today. It's his ideas and her words. And the way that Doreen Valiant phrased it, she said, and it harm none, do as ye will. And that was uttered in a speech in 1964. That was the first time the wider Wiccan community, pagan community heard those words. Uh, and later you find the same phrasing published in uh, two different large magazines at the time, which is the uh, way that they used to organize the most before the internet. <laughs> they used to uh, have magazines and call each other on the phone and stuff, <laughs> uh, write letters to people <laughs> into magazines. Uh, and so those, uh, those publications were very influential as well and really dis uh, just dispersed this phrasing widely. And we're going to talk about those two publications in a little bit more detail because that is really where the modern read found its, uh, the longer form of it that I read to you just now find has its foundation. Now, uh, Lady Gwen Thompson claims that she got the stanzas for the Wiccan read from her grandmother, Adriana Porter. And the uh, many of the phrasings and the adages that you see in this old read do likely come from uh, uh, f you know, from her mother's teachings, uh, they match the lifestyle, they match, you know, um, the old English phrasings, and they talk about many things that were culturally relevant at the time. But there are some that have modern language and modern ideas. Uh, so it's very likely that Thompson added to this original Wiccan read herself. And, uh, and that's what witches do, you know, so is she really doing anything that any other <laughs> Wiccan leader ha would No, she's, being a Wiccan witch, right? She's taking the teachings from her ancestors and she's making them her own and channeling them through her and putting her will into them and putting her love into them. And that makes them better, more whole, uh, more complete. She puts them back out there and then others are meant to come along and receive her words and do the same. And that is the foundation of the Wiccan religion is living just like the natural world that we worship. Wicca is alive. It evolves, it grows, it is nourished by the Wiccan philosophers and Wiccan authors who speak a, a, according to these classic Wiccan themes. And that's why it is so important to learn what it is to be authentically Wiccan. You see my bookshelf back here? I mean, you got to just read them. You got to just go and read the classic authors. Go and read some of the books that are written by Doreen Valiant herself. You know, if you don't have this on your bookshelf, you're probably not doing Wiccan philosophy correctly. <laughs> Maybe not this one, but Doreen Valiant, the author, should be on your bookshelf somewhere, uh, in your digital book library, whatever. You know, I, I, I've read the classic, the original. You should read it. It's tough, but it's worth it. It's a good story. And there's, uh, there's just a lot that you need to, you know, even the things that I don't really like or agree with, where they have a lot of like Christian hate and such things. But Charles Godfrey Leland, he's one of the first people who was, uh, who was romanticizing witchcraft in the early 1900s. And that romanticism is what became modern Wicca. So if you don't read these things, you don't have the authentic understanding and connection with the philosophy that you need to really be able to ensure that your own teachings and philosophies are Wiccan and not something else, something new. And there's nothing wrong with it if it is something else and something new. Um, but that's, you know, that's the idea is that you want to be original and you want to, you know, but you have to also have authentic experiences. You have to understand something authentically. That is what Gerald Gardner tried to teach everyone. <laughs> He's an anthropologist. He believed himself to be a man of science. They were not really doing science back then, <laughs> not very well, but he believed himself to be and he wanted us all to be. And that is why I think it is so important to me to teach everybody metaphysics and just enough, just enough that you guys can really uh, have a, a logical way of thinking and a tether to the objective reality, even while you explore your own subjective realities. Now, I wanted to start off talking about this, comparing the uh, original read to the modern read by just reading it, 
I think you will hear a lot of the common phrasings that you hear throughout all of Wiccan literature and all of our rituals and spells. This is the single most uh, inspirational and, and aspirational, and you meditate on these words and you hear your versions of them, and the quarter callings were inspired by this. Uh, you get the blessed be phrase from this. Uh, you get the, um, you know, trace the circle thrice about to keep the evil spirits out, the process of casting circle and marry me and marry part. All of the phrasings that we use are found here within the original read. I have it printed in my book on page 52. You can find it online. And it goes like this. By the Wiccan laws ye must in perfect love and perfect trust. Live and let live, fairly take and fairly give, cast the circle thrice about to keep the evil spirits out, to bind the spell every time, let the spell be spake in rhyme, soft of eye and light of touch, speak little, listen much. Deusil go by the waxing moon, sing and dance the Wiccan rune. Wittershins go when moon doth wane, and the werewolves howl by the dread wolf's vein. When the lady's moon is new, kiss the hand to her times two. When the moon rides at her peak, then your heart's desire seek. Heed the north wind's mighty gale, lock the door and drop the sail. When the wind comes from the south, love will kiss thee on the mouth. When the wind blows from the east, expect the new and set the feast. When the west wind blows o'er the departed spirits, restless be. Nine woods in the cauldron go, burn them quick and burn them slow. Elder be ye lady's tree, burn it not or cursed ye'll be. When the wheel begins to turn, let the Beltane fires burn. When the wheel has turned a yule, let the light the log and let pan rule. Heed ye flowers, bush and tree, by the lady blessed be. Where the rippling waters go, cast a stone and truth ye'll know. When ye have need, hearken not to others' greed. With the fool no season spend or be counted as his friend. Merry meet and merry part, bright the cheeks and warm the heart. Mind the threefold law ye should, three times bad and three times good. When misfortune is a no, is a no, a now, wear the blue star on thy brow. True in love ever be, unless thy lover's false to thee. Eight words the wicked read fulfill, and it harm none, do as ye will. Blessed be. Written by Lady Gwen Thompson. Likely many of these came directly from her grandmother, Adriana Porter, but a lot of it was probably added on herself. And that is the essence of Wicca. Taking something that has been passed down to you, taking down those, those wisdoms, making them better, longer, more applicable to the modern times, and then sending that energy back out into the world. So this form was published in 1974 and 1975, uh, and the later version that is shorter, uh, that is only eight lines, we see uh, something similar to that in Witchcraft for Tomorrow, published by During Valiant in 1978, uh, and then we see it everywhere. And then we see it everywhere, pretty much all simultaneously. Everyone has taken the first and last stanza. Everyone is repeating them in their own specific way, in their own specific phrasings, and that has no one common author. Uh, and it just was, you know, everyone saw it, read it, related to it, and made it their own. And that is how that Wiccan read came to be the Wiccan read. <laughs> now, what does the Wiccan read mean? Okay, so let's talk about what the Rick Wiccan read means. So first, the Wiccan read states, Bide the Wiccan law ye must. And this could be referring to the Wiccan laws that were written by Gerald Gardner which he wrote eventually, and you can find them published in his Book of Shadows. But uh, they were not there originally, and they are very targeted <laughs> towards uh, Doreen Valiant and trying to limit the powers of the High Priestess. And it really came about because many of Gardner's students and Doreen Valiant herself, so her students as well, um, it, they did not like the popularity. They did not like the spotlight. They thought that, you know, secrecy is, is meant to follow and they thought it was dangerous, um, that people should not be messing with these things unattended as well. Um, and they just didn't, and Jar Gerald Gardner was like, look, I'm trying to change the world here. <laughs> okay. So I get your, 
I get your fears, but I'm trying to make the world friendly towards people who do magic by by building a religion that is based around love and light, like Christianity, that has dogma of its own, uh, that is a full religion with its own denominations and everything that is based around worshiping nature and the practice of magic. And they did not want to be in the spotlight, so they diverged. And many of them left to go form other covens. Doreen Valiant became a solitary witch. Uh, she spent most of her life as a witch, as a solitary. Uh, she uttered the Wiccan Reed as a solitary witch. And she was very much saying that people should be able to practice Wicca on their own, with or without a coven, as long as they do it authentically. And that's what you'll find in her writings as well, the same mentality. I learned it from her, okay? So don't credit me. Authenticity is important. <laughs> and many people have, have thought so for a very long time. Now, the Wiccan law in this line, if you don't believe in the Gardnerian Wiccan laws, which are very specific to Gardner's Coven at the time, so many don't. Many have their own version of those laws that they write themselves. And many will just take that to refer to you that this is the law that is henceforth defined. So it's not just advice or counsel. It is also an oath that you are speaking. You're treating it like a law. So many will interpret the words to mean that instead. Now, the next line in perfect love and and perfect trust. Some say in perfect love and perfect trust, and some say in perfect love and perfect trust, which means that you give perfect trust if you receive perfect love, and that Wiccans will only give trust to people who truly love them and accept them as they are. So the one interpretation of this is that you should be like a rose. You should have thorns. You should only uh, open up to people who you are sure will appreciate your beauty. Many people will take this to mean that all Wiccans approach all situations in reality in their lives with the mindset of perfect love and perfect trust, especially when it comes to other witches or Wiccans. If you've sworn this oath, then we trust you, we love you, and we are kin. So many people will take it to mean that instead. If all of them take it to mean essentially that if trust is given, love will follow. Uh, and, and mostly this refers to uh, a Wiccan's open mind and honest intentions and just a kindness in their heart uh, that they approach uh, others with when it comes to spirituality and, and understanding and, and, um, and they try to get along with people. The next line is eight words the Wiccan read fulfill. So many will take this to say that the next eight words are how you fulfill the Wiccan read. Uh, some take this to mean that the next eight lines are a counsel or advice, eight words the Wiccan read fulfill, as in the next eight lines fulfill the promise of advice given from one leader to the next. Like, okay, witch, here is your wisdom, <laughs> right? Live like this and you'll be happy. So many will take it to mean that, that this is advice and not a binding law. Many take it to mean that the following line is how you fulfill this binding law. And it harm none, do as ye will. Harm none. The single most widely interpreted uh, two words in the read in all of Wiccan philosophy. <laughs> and it's the guts of the read, okay? <laughs> it's the most ambiguous part on purpose. You're meant to interpret it for yourself. So I'll just tell you the ways that it's interpreted by many people. Uh, first of all, people will say, what is harm? Uh, is it only magical action or any action? So in Wicca, uh, there's this idea that people should not seek to harm others through prayer, invocation, spell work, any magical action, be it out of revenge, for fun, for experimentation, by accident. You're supposed to take strides to ensure you don't make accidents. And if you are not, if you're being reckless, that's going to come back on you. Um, most Wiccans take this to mean that you should live frugally that you should have an ecologically conservative lifestyle, uh, try not to generate waste, live modestly, try to live off of your own land if you can. Um, then there are other people who say, because Wiccans are divine, they take action to seek alignment with divinity. So they exist on three levels, physical, emotional, and spiritual. You align those when you do spell work. And that alignment, living in that alignment, a realized uh, Wiccan, a high priestess, uh, an elder, surely, is going to be a person who is always aligned and then every one of their actions is divine. So if that person acts just physically, 
they're really acting emotionally and spiritually as well. So they take this to, to mean that you should not even do harm with your physical actions, even, even the action of feeding your physical, even the action of feeding your physical body with other animal products and, uh, and other animal meat, not being vegan or vegetarian, in other words, that lifestyle may be considered harmful because those animals have to be sacrificed for you to live. Now, there are many people that do not have the luxury or the ability to say goodbye to that sort of lifestyle. There are reasons to believe that it is not inherently unwicked to celebrate the death of the animals that are necessary to your survival. There's a theme of sacrifice in Wicca, a theme of the hunt. And classic traditional Wiccans are usually not vegan or vegetarian because they believe that life requires sacrifice, that nature is metal, <laughs> and that that's just the nature of, of life, and that, and that living in tune with nature means allowing yourself to be a part of that cycle, a part of that process. So it's not more Wiccan or less Wiccan to believe you should be vegan or vegetarian. It's just different interpretations of the same philosophy and the same experiences that we all have in different ways. We'll talk about why that's also completely allowable in Wicca as well, and why we're all meant to have different experience taken in different ways. But the one thing that all people agree with is that you should try not to hurt others with your actions, lest in self-defense it be, ever mind the rule of three. So Wiccans believe in self-defense, they believe in acting to preserve your own life, even if they believe in do not harm others, they still believe that it's your right and often your duty to protect yourself. They often will believe that it is your right or duty to protect other innocent beings, which is why you find so many Wiccans who are advocates for LGBTQ plus rights, for um, animal rights, for all different kinds of these uh, humanitarian movements. You find that because Wiccans are very called to, uh, to freedom, to allowing everyone to have autonomy and freedom to pursue a lifestyle that makes them happy and able to connect with divinity. They believe in empowerment and the only truly immoral action as seen from Wicca is one that takes away another's ability to decide for themselves how they want to act or conduct themselves, right? So you can use that framework to condemn murder. You can use that framework to condemn all kinds of acts and you can also use it to dissect, you know, uh, modern political topics and figure out where you lie. But you're going to find most Wiccans and witches are probably on the progressive side of the spectrum. They tend to be a little more liberal because of that belief in uh, individual liberty and personal freedom uh, and that everyone should live the lifestyle that suits them the best. They're, they're very lacking in judgment, very big on live and let live. Um, People can do whatever they want in the confines of their own space. And if it makes me uncomfortable, I will just keep it out of my space. <laughs> and, uh, and that's like the, the mindset. They really only act in self-defense. Usually if someone is doing something that is harmful, that they're hurting innocent people, you, you may find Wiccans doing curses under those circumstances. Usually it's going to be things that um, disable the person and keep them from doing those harmful things as opposed to things that actually wind up hurting them. But again, it just varies from which to which and different tradition to tradition. Um, so you're, you're never going to find a full consensus on this. Uh, and we're going to talk about the rule of three in a minute. The threefold law, it's called. That's like Wicca's view of karma. And in the context of the Wiccan read, it's really just about okay, there are consequences for my actions. If I do cause harm on people, that's a, there's going to be consequences for that. So I should keep that in mind. And then how you interpret what those consequences will be, what actions will or will not incur consequences, that's all for you to decide for yourself in Wicca. The last two phrases here are, follow this in mind and heart, and marry ye meet and marry ye part. So we talked a little bit about the and marry meet and marry part. Either it's if we leave in good favor, we will meet in good favor. And that's true. So Wiccans are very confrontational. They're not very passive. They're very big on, why would you do that? This is how I'm feeling about what you just did. Now let's talk about it and figure it out before we say goodbye so that I'm sure we'll, that the next time we see each other, it'll be a fond hello. <laughs> Wiccans are very big on taking accountability, taking responsibility. Uh, so that's generally just like authentic Wicca is big on saying, okay, I'm sorry, maybe it's my fault. Let's just talk it out. 
um, a lot of people will also take it to just refer to like, um, you know, that it, you're never really parted from your loved ones, right? We don't really say goodbye. We say until we meet again. Um, and that's just because like in Wicca, you know, you're an aligned being, you have this timeless awareness. So your loved ones feel like they're always with you and you're always thinking about them and they're always on your mind. You're spending energy on them, even when you can't see them. Uh, that is a very Wiccan way to conduct yourself. And that renders as well in this and Mary meet and Mary part till Mary meet again. That is the mindset of a Wiccan witch. So that's the final part here. Many people think that this is the binding part of the oath, the follow this in mind and heart. You're saying, I will follow this in my mind and in my heart, in my emotional self, in my physical self, in my intentions. Uh, I will do everything in my power to follow these rules in perfect love and perfect trust. And that is what makes me Wiccan. That is what gives me the moral code of a Wiccan witch. So um, that's it. That's Wicca and, and witchcraft. That's the moral code. Uh, it's not very, um, it's pretty ambiguous. <laughs> it does, it leaves you with a lot of like more questions than you, it, it answers. And you're like, okay, well, can I get an abortion? Can I uh, uh, do a curse on a person? Can I bind someone if it's, if they're hurting themselves with their actions, then is it okay to bind them? What about binding spirits and working with the dead? Uh, so there's a lot of things that are not really answered by this read. And that's why Wicca and witchcraft are really gray religions. They're in the ethical gray area. You will find people do things in Wicca and witchcraft that would make Christian people uncomfortable. Um, and you'll find that there are people even within Wicca that are uncomfortable by the way that other Wiccans will act. Um, so you have to just remember to think really far ahead and really know yourself and say, uh, is this something that I will feel guilty for doing? Is this something that um, I'm not sure is wholly in my own best interest? Even if you're not sure about an objective moral code, the best way to ensure that something doesn't come back to get you is just to be sure about your own feelings and intentions on something before you do it. A lot of Wiccans will or witches will, um, you know, consult their divination tools and they'll say, this is what I want to do. I put some time and thought into it. Let me just see if this is a good idea and <laughs> like double check when I should do it. Like use my cards, use my runes, figure that out. Often the cards and runes will be like, don't do this. And they'll be like, here's the deck card here's the tower and you're like oh maybe this is a bad idea <laughs> and you'll rethink what you meant to be doing and Wiccans do believe that they live in tune with divinity and that divinity has its own will divinity is within and around us so you know we believe we don't have all the facts <laughs> and we try to live in tune with divinity so that we can become aware of the things that we don't know and we can minimize the amount of things that we do that may have inadvertent consequences to ourselves or others um, because any inadvertent consequence is considered failed magic, <laughs> uh, even if it's a good one, because it means that you've invited chaos, right? And the idea behind most Wiccan magic is that it's ordered. It's a, it's a process that works with divinity. It's a propagation of divinity into reality, but it's more than just a prayer. And we'll talk about the difference between asking and demanding, so to speak. But Wiccans think about their deities as being friends, guides, people that have mutual interests in, in, uh, in wellness. Um, and so Wiccans work with the flow of the universe, not against it, uh, but they are still empowered to take action. And they believe that individual will is the purpose of reality. We exist in our individual forms, in the way that we are, with our egos, with our bodies being how they are and the limitations that are imposed on us by that physical reality. Um, we are the way that we think and the product of the things that have happened to us, even the bad things, the suffering is a good net good in the end because it's all an experience that builds you towards purpose, towards meaning. Even the people that end their lives tragically are people that have greater purpose and greater meaning and they influence us as well. And they take some lessons with them, even if the burden of their lives is too great, that doesn't mean that they were a failure. Like they came here to do certain things and they pass when it is their time to pass. And if that was their will, God's will, it makes no difference. It is just will. It is all just will. 
It only looks different to us because we experience the passage of time. And I gave you all the Kabbalah in past lectures so that you can understand this right here, the duality of action. You are empowered to act. You are meant to be you and to do what you want to do and to have the desires that you have. You ought to be you or you would not have been born unique. But you also have to consider that your actions have consequences that extend beyond you and that you may not be fully aware of when you act. And that's why you should seek a relationship with divinity according to Wiccan philosophy. Now, let's get into some of the beliefs about how we relate to and interact with divinity. If you remember back to the previous lecture, we talked about divinity and what it physically is. So just a quick recap on metaphysics in one ear and out the other, if this is too much. But we are one process experiencing itself. And if you want to look up a really good representation of that, check out the egg. Uh, by the way, there's many different versions of it. Good one. Uh, we are the process of order. And we are the manifestation of order into reality. And we are also driven by the bias of the universe towards order. So we ourselves are ordered beings that want existence to be more ordered. We generally view disordered things that occur without rhyme or reason, nonsense. We generally call that evil. We call that bad <laughs> because we like order. We like things to make sense. We like things to be predictable. We like things to be familiar. And that is written into the universe itself. It is the bias towards matter versus antimatter, the bias towards concealed higher dimensions, the foundation of modern physics. And that is what we talked about in the past lecture and the entire metaphysics series. I'll make sure there is a card for that metaphysics series so that if you're like, wait, what's going on? What? How does that work? You could just go and watch that nine hours <laughs> over there and not get the nine hours in this series <laughs> Here, where we're going to move on to um, how do you connect with divinity? How do you connect with divinity? Well, through the parts of you that are higher planar, through the parts of you that exist in a greater number of dimensions, right? How we discuss the parts of you that are abstract, your uh, imagination, your willpower, uh, your desire to create and to uh, express yourself. That is a beautiful thing that you should celebrate. And it takes many forms within Wicca, and it's often in Wicca tightly bound with the um, cycles of the moon, the waxing and waning, okay? And it fits this triple form stage, and you find this tri-stage uh, echoed in every culture, everywhere on the planet. It is just a way that people connect with processes and change, uh, the idea of a sine curve, the idea of oscillation, ebb and flow, push and pull, back and forth. Well, it's dual, ebb and flow, push and pull. That is opposite forces interacting. We'll talk about duality and polarity in a second. But it also, for humans, it feels like a moment occurs at each of those stages. When you get to the top of the curve, it's a moment, it's, an, it's a memory, it's an experience, it's something you can relate to and understand. And that is where the concept of cardinality comes from. It is the humanity, it is the uh, conscious being projected onto that time period, interpreting that moment and experiencing it as a moment, as a phase as a, a common experience that everyone has as a nature of their biology. When you're young, you are waxing, you are growing, you are taking in tons of energy and using it to build new parts, form new connections, find new ways of doing things. Waxing energy, growing larger, it is new, it is fresh, it has somewhere to grow, it has somewhere to be. The full stage, you're at your peak, you're the maximum you. You can create at will according to your own desire. Then you are waning, you are 
aging, you are tired, you are sleeping more, you're getting ready to sleep forever. Then you're asleep, you're dark, you're new, nobody can see you, nobody's aware of you, are you even real? Where do you exist? Non-being, until you are born again. It is an understanding of the duality of deity as a process that occurs over time. That is cardinality. Waxing, full, waning, new. And it's a pseudoscience, okay? It arises from the physics. It is an intuitive way of understanding the way all things function in our universe. All things ebb and flow, oscillate, vibrate, shift in and out of dimensions on levels too high to conceive of. And that was our previous lecture. <laughs> so in Wicca, we relate to those concepts by being human, okay? That is the one thing we were born to do. That is what we know how to do. We know how to be ourselves. We know how to be human. We don't always necessarily understand the abstract concept of God. So we try. We try and understand a timeless reality, a realityless reality. Anything that could be is. But we do it from the lens of our own experiences. And in cardinality, our experience is young, full, you know, middle-aged and old. <laughs> and when you're young, you're a maiden, you're a warrior, and you're a guardian. So the foundation of the energy that waxes and grows aligns with Artemis, Athena, um, warrior gods like uh, who? Uh, Thor. Uh, no, he's a father. Uh, who are the warrior gods? Put them in the comments. There are so many. And people will just relate to the energy of those archetypes of being. And we're using the word archetype in the same way that um, Carl Jung uses it. And they'll relate to this common experience of being young and feeling young inside of them, feeling youthful, and seeing the creative power of that energy on the world around them in the springtime, for instance. And that's how they can relate to the divine concept of ebb. Then you have the full, okay, the mother and the father, the keeper of wisdom. You have the one who holds the key to passing the knowledge to the next generation. The one who restarts the cycle. That is the mother and the father. And the cycle is restarted before it ends so that it is always moving, always ticking the the full stage the mother and father many examples of those right father figures zeus odin uh who else uh the morrigan is a triform deity so is the dogda they have a form at each stage uh there's many deities like that that take one form or another throughout their life just like we do the gods are created in the image of us because they are our ability to understand the abstract so they have to be a projection of us. They have to be a projection of us, but one that also bridges the gap to higher understanding. The waiting stage is called the crone, the grandmother, the sage, father, catonic deities, underworld deities, death, decay, waning. And then you have the new energy. Many Wiccans do not work with that energy at all. They will pull from the waxing or the waning only. They'll treat it like three phases of cardinality, not four. And they will ignore the new because they don't want to invite any chaos or any disorder into their lives. Many will work with chaos deities, demons or dragons, things that align with this energy. They may or may not do spell work. Many people will meditate only during that phase. Uh, it's this dark period that people will use largely for shadow work. Uh, and that is cardinality in Wicca and how it influences archetypes. Next, we'll talk about polarity. We talked about it a little bit. The idea of two opposing forces, push and pull, ebb and flow. In Wicca, this takes the form of light and dark, or life and death, as well as masculine and feminine. And these four forces in the four corners of this grid here, this is what defines Asiya, the plane of action. Everything on this plane of existence exists over time. It is a process that exists over time. It must act. It must change. It evolves. It decays, etc. 
actions come from one source or another. Initially, their, their intention, the way that they come about aligns with one of these intentions, and then it manifests into all of them. So all of these are within each other. There's masculine and there's feminine, but they are within each other. And we're not talking about the modern concept of gender. Uh, and we will talk about that in chapter nine when we talk about postmodern Wicca. We're just talking about the labeling of these two forces, one which is aggression, action, one which is receptivity, hesitation, thinking things through before you act. And death magic spells, by the way, uh, we don't really cover too much in here in necromancy. Uh, most Wiccans will work with the light side, so that's why the dot is closer up towards the light and it's perfectly in between masculine and feminine. Uh, death magic uh, uh, is used for spells, it's used mostly for divination, but it's also used for anything that would benefit from an air of timelessness. Uh, or memory or wisdom. It's used uh, if you're seeking to destroy life. It's used for cursing a lot. Um, it can also be used uh, to take life from a space and then repurpose it. So um, it's used in very complex spell work or divination is its more straightforward form. Uh, life magic is going to be anything that involves generating will, generating intent, uh, generating energy from your physical body, that's life magic. Um, and uh, it really needs to be harmonious with the energy of the space you live in because everything that physically exists in that space is a part of life. It's ordered existence, the walls, the, you know, this is why Wiccans would say that you need to uh, clean up the floors and clean up your space before you do magic because that mess, that disorder will influence the results of the ordered spell you're trying to create. Duality of deity in Wicca, we talked about this a little bit. It refers to the fact that all coins have two sides. Uh, we know this. We do not pretend like deity is wholly good. Uh, we choose to work with the good sides of deity only, but we're willing to take with the good with the bad uh, because that is what true love is. Uh, we prefer to work with the light-based sides of divinity, and uh, we typically are doing that because we believe that they will that that will attract the energy in our own lives that we'd like to have, which is love and light and ordered things. Um, so, you know, uh, divinity is both capable in Kabbalistic terms. Divinity is both capable of gavura and chesed. It can be judgment. It can be kindness, avoiding the darker sides of divinity. And therefore also the self, because divinity is within us as well as around us, as above, so below, which we'll talk about that phrase in a moment. But that doesn't actually make it go away. To ignore it doesn't make it go away uh, because it just diminishes the awareness of it and pushes it into your shadow self, which is Carl Jung's terminology again. It pushes it out of your ability to recall that it's a part of you. Uh, and harmony with chaos that only comes when you're willing to take the good with the bad. So harmony on a gray religious path where you do not just embody wisdom and find meaning in everything that happens to you and you're kind of more passive. In a path where you are empowered, usually there will be more chaos involved and you will have to just be like, okay, well, this spell went awry. <laughs> Guess I'm going to not try that. I'm going to try some different blend next time or throwing in pepper was too strong for this one, you know? So... That's the essence of faith and wisdom, the right-handed path, but also a mindset of, you know, it was my own fault, it's my own actions, it's my own will, and I should take accountability and try new things next time. And, you know, so it's a blend of that in Wicca. And that's the duality of deity manifest into our own perceptions and how we think and act in ourselves. So as above, so below, the foundation of sympathetic magic. We'll talk about that some more. Divinity is both within us and around us. It is contained within us in finite vessels that observe discreteness, a separation between ourselves and the walls and the books and the people watching this. We appear to be separate, but we are really one system engaged in a meaningful experience together right now, I should think. And that is magic. That's what magic is. The fact that you can watch this later and have a meaningful experience and learn about yourself from a different place in space-time, as if it didn't matter and you're sitting in the room with me right now, is magic. Deity is both within us and around us, and both of them are important to a balanced being. 
The last thing to talk about when it comes to duality before we move on, and this is kind of an aside, are Gardner's eight qualities of duality. So Gardner once, you know, sat in gardens and stared at blue skies and looked for shapes in the clouds, probably, uh, and came to understand many of these concepts for himself. And in doing so, he in the, thought of deity as being dual in these four ways, kind of like four dimensions, which is what we all exist in. So that's actually kind of cool and a really good sign that he was on the right track to understanding some higher wisdom because he had an intuitive understanding of something that can be found represented in the science as well. And he said that deity is dual in the concept of beauty and strength, power versus compassion, mirth versus reverence, and honor versus humility. And the duality here refers to the essential balance uh, that you gain when you act to garner respect for yourself what, you know, from others while also acting without care for respect because you are acting in a capacity that is more uh, transcendent than ego-driven. And it's not obvious how these things are dualities, I think, in modern day. I think it's beneficial to people to sit down and just kind of um, meditate on these terms and think about how they might be considered opposites. You can look at my interpretations in my uh, open-minded wake up. Uh, there's PDF in our library. If you need a PDF, please um, put a comment, but you can also buy it on Amazon. Um, it's just a really nice reference. But yeah, so you can read my interpretations in here if you want some inspiration. But really, I think in order to be a Wiccan witch and have a Wiccan relationship with divinity, it's important for you to have your own personal connection with those dualities and how they translate into an ego-driven um, and yet transcendent. And that's what we call the divine persona. It's like the bridge. It's not really the ego. It's just the the translation software between ego and divinity, which is the lack of ego. So using those phrases helps you build that bridge for yourself, build that divine persona in a way that is inherently Wiccan. So if that's something that matters to you, I would spend time meditating on those phrases as you practice meditating and, and learn how to um, how to get into that altered headspace and find hidden meanings and things that that enrich you and, and make you more um, of your version of a spiritual person. Now, the, the prism principle is how we bring all of this together. <laughs> the prism principle is how we tie duality and cardinality together. It brings a view of deity that is not dichotomy or that that is uh not monotheistic and not polytheistic so it's kind of like a superposition where you could believe that there's one god uh you could believe that there's many gods you could believe that it's not a god at all it's just a higher consciousness that we can't really relate to or understand so there's no sense pursuing a relationship with said deity and that would be atheism and all of those uh all of those ways of viewing divinity emerge from the objective truth of the physics. So none of them is any more valid than the other. And the metaphor that we like to use for that in Wicca is a prism. So we say that every person is a unique prism. Every person is a physical object that has a unique configuration of molecules and atoms and a puts off a vibration that is unique in the same way that a crystalline structure has unique vibration. If you shoot uh, a white light into a prism and it refracts and forms a rainbow on the wall, is it white light? Yes, <laughs> it certainly is at the start. Is it colored light? Yes, <laughs> it is colored and it is white. And you can't tell that it's both at the same time until it's gone through the prism. And that is where we get the concept of archetypes from. That is why we all have different relationships with divinity. We are all a unique kind of prism. And when that white light of God shines through us, 
call it God, call it the all conscious, call it fate. I have a Jewish background. I lived as an Orthodox Jew for many years. I'm Jewish by heritage. So I call it God. <laughs> you can call it whatever you want. And it goes through us and, and becomes a spectrum of largely ego-driven archetypes, but things that are driven on a level of ego that is beyond the conscious notion of self. It is from the collective unconscious. It is written by the common experiences we all have as a result of our DNA. And we will all refract God in different ways because we're all different. So there's no invalid path except the one that comes along and says, my relationship with divinity, my relationship with divinity and my prism are true for you too. No, it's not. It's not. We're all individual and that will never be true. How do you know that you're being called to work with deity? Many people will um, have visions of their signs and symbols and dreams, or they'll start to see them everywhere they look. Um, it'll feel creepy sometimes, like you're being stalked almost. Um, you'll have a sense of familiarity and simplicity with that kind of energy. Uh, you know, there's benefits that come to working with the deity, whether they call to you or not, just working with the same person every time gives you that sense of familiarity, that security. It gives you an increased sense of order. This is why there's a lot of power to like the Catholic mass. Even if you go there and sit there and have no idea what you're doing or like feel connected to God at all, it still is a powerful thing to participate in an ordered routine that uh, many people participate in together. And that's the beautiful thing about that path that you don't have to really know what you're doing to still be protected by having good habits. In Wicca, you have to be deliberate. You have to know what you're doing and why, because it's an expression of your will. And you're not usually participating in some big, broad activity that many, many people do, and it's powered by sheer numbers. <laughs> um, in Wicca, you have to be more proactive. Um, and most Wiccans will work with specific deities that help them feel the most empowered and the most deliberate over their own craft. And um, they should make you feel better about yourself. Working with divinity should make you feel good. <laughs> If it doesn't make you feel good, you're probably doing it wrong. <laughs> um, you're probably not working with deity the way that you think you should, or it's being informed by your own biases or traumas from the past. You're projecting working with deity. If you're just invoking deity, you're praying to deity, you've got patrons, you've got an altar to them. All of that should feel good and help you feel better about yourself and better about your life. And if it doesn't make you feel like that, then you're probably not working with the right deities or you're doing something sketchy by accident and you should talk to me about it or you know, should read an email then. <laughs> but you should feel good working with your deities. Even archetypes invented in the here and now can still help you connect with divinity. They do not have to be age old archetypes. Ancient wisdom is not inherently more valuable than modern wisdom. It's wisdom's wisdom. It's just like either it helps you and others lead a happy, healthy, wholesome existence or it doesn't. <laughs> so either it's wise or it's not. And if it's ancient or it's not ancient, it doesn't make any difference at all. Uh, I mean, it makes a little bit of a difference, right? So if someone is working with a certain uh, archetype of deity and they're not having a positive a relationship with that deity and they're like well this relationship has been different for me than it has been for these people historically maybe that's a sign that they're not really connecting with the energy they think they are and they could be doing something dangerous so um that is a good reason to work with deities that have a history because you can get to know them through the way others have known them and be sure that you're working with the right energy um, but you could just as easily especially if you're an advanced practitioner sit in a room and think of all your own wisdoms and all your own deities and all your own creation myths and none of them are any more or less valid than any that have existed in the past as long as they are truly influenced by a harmonious relationship a harmonious marriage between higher order and lower order as long as they are both uh, a representation of your ego and your spiritual needs in this lifetime and a representation of transcendent wisdom now the great rite the great rite is a uh an act of uh, ritual magic and we're going to talk about exactly how to do it and do examples of it as well it's foundational to Wicca. I bring it up in the Wiccan belief section because it is bound to an underlying belief in fertility as a metaphor for manifestation. Uh, the Great Rite is the form of arismancy. Um, it's a usually symbolic in the modern age act of combining masculine and feminine. And this represents the need for balance in the world. And the act of conception, which is, you know, the birth of a child or the birth of 
some new ordered being into existence, the birth of order comes from harmonious extremes. That is duality manifest into fertility and conception. And it's probably the thing many people have the most trouble with when they come to Wicca from a divergent uh, LGBTQ plus experience. It can be difficult to rectify that experience with this notion of man and woman make baby. <laughs> so um, we will talk about how to do that a little bit more in depth in the ninth chapter, uh, much later in the course. But for now, uh, just know that sex is sacred in Wicca um, and not just sex, but like making love like with a partner who you intend to have children with is considered sacred. Um, in public rituals, the rite is symbolic. It is a sexual experience, but there is no arousal. Uh, there's no like lust. It's not like an orgy at all. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a sexual energy that is redirected into the spell work instead of felt in the emotional self. And, it, and it's more so just intimate. It's very intimate when you do it with people around. It feels very like, ooh, look what we're doing together. This is very, ugh, it's, it's erotic. It's interesting. Oh, we're doing the symbol of this and it means something very profound and it's really capturing the energy of what we're trying to accomplish and the, our, it represents the birth of our will into manifestation and it just feels very like electricity in the group and then when it's over you know it feels silly it feels funny so we'll talk about that in private rituals it's usually two heterosexual partners do the great right together you will find heterosexual uh, uh, homosexual partners doing the right, great right together people with non-conforming bits do it as well um there's many different variations but it's not about the um it's not about the uh orgasm it's not like chaos magic it's really the sex in the great right is about the conception of a child so you will find many modern Wiccans who never do the Great Rite in the, its actual form because it doesn't align with their uh, sexual orientation or their configuration of parts. Um, but they will do the symbolic version of their in their practices because they understand the significance of birth and of giving life and the meaning of it. They can still relate to that even without the desire to themselves have that kind of sex or produce children or any of those kinds of things. The fivefold blessing is a way to consecrate the entire body and denote it as sacred and prepared to have divinity within it. Uh, you say usually five blessings, one for each of the body parts as you go up the body. You would say it on your partner and they would say it for you if you're doing it with someone. Um, there are six blessings here and some of them have alternative phrasings because you would choose different ones. Some people will use the womb phallus no matter what the parts of the person holding the tools are because they're, it's a symbolic representation. And in that moment, they are embodying femininity and have the parts of reproduction. But uh, many people will omit that line in favor of the other ones so that they're not really even touching on the physical parts of the person. They're not really trying to uh, have that physical representation. It's just symbolic. Um, so everyone will choose different variations of this blessing. There's many combinations for every kind of anatomy. <laughs> so pick the ones that work best for you. Make up your own, uh, whatever you want to do. You use oil during this step, um, mint oil or um, orange oil, something that is patchouli is common, olive, something that is divine, that is um, truffle oil would be a good one if you like the smell of truffles. Uh, I never thought about that before now, but that's a good idea. Uh, things that feel divine, that feel like sacred, that are less common, those are what you would usually use for anointing the body um, and usually you do it to each other or you could do it to yourself if you're doing the right alone. You should still do something like it. Consecrate your body. Denote yourself as sacred in that moment and it will make the representation of the magic feel more authentic and that is what will make the magic successful. After that, everyone's really silly. Uh, it's the after the climax and sex when everyone's hanging out in the bed and just like, oh, silly, you know, that's, you just, lay around with your partner and giggle and roll around and tickle each other or tell stories or stare at the ceiling or whatever people do. And that is what the cakes and ale portion feels like. Many call it the spiritual bullshitting portion <laughs> where you just kind of shoot the shit. But um, it's really just a time for enjoying each other's company, feeling vulnerable together with people that you know you're safe with, um, feeling communal. 
Um, people share food. You bless the wine as a part of the great rite, and then you use that to bless the food, and you pass them around. Some pass them in opposite directions so that it's like a circle within a circle kind of vibes. Some pass them both the same way to the right, which is um, clockwise, because it represents like waxing and bringing abundance. And you say a blessing, may you never hunger, may you never thirst as you pass it around. Um, and it doesn't have to be alcohol. Uh, it can be any kind of food, any kind of drink. Many will use tea, coffee, juices. Um, freshly squeezed things are better. Like the fresher, better the ingredients, the better it is. Uh, many of people will insist on making homemade goods for the food that passes around. Uh, you might sing, you might dance, you might drum, uh, you might tell stories. Um, and you it's the idea of sympathetic magic, right? As above, so below. So if we want our will to be born into the world, we symbolize the birth of a child in ritual, we symbolize the conception at least, uh, and then it's up to us to be committed to that spell and to see that it does get born into the world the way that we intended. The threefold law, AKA the rule of three. Uh, this one, and I made, a, I made up this little rhyme to help you remember. This one is really just about karma. And it's the idea that what one does comes back to be. Give by one, receive by three. So it's sort of like Newton's laws of motion, <laughs> but for spells. And the idea is that witches and Wiccans specifically take time to align themselves with the lower parts of themselves, the physical, the emotional selves that are like represented by the elements. We'll talk about that in the next lecture, uh, actually in a couple lectures. And they will align that part of themselves with the divine, the spiritual part. And they think in that way, when you're truly a realized witch and you're all aligned, every action you take, even if it's purely a physical one, eating food, punching someone in the nose, all of those things are things that will um, propagate out on three levels, even if you don't see it go out on all three of those levels, so that you know, every action for every force, there's an equal but opposite reaction, right? An equal but opposite force. So then you will receive that back to you, but it may come on three levels. So if you're not aware of how it went out on all three of those levels, then it may come back to you in a way that is shocking or that um, seems um, where it, it, it may seem like it's just disproportionate, the response, like you're being punished for some action. Uh, and that is why like, People will think that you're getting three times what you gave. Really, you're getting exactly what you gave. Really, you get what you give in life. Um, give by one, receive by three. You know, so when a witch acts in any capacity, doing absolutely anything, if she's truly aligned, then she's going to receive by three for any action she does, even if it's not obvious. Um, so that is kind of the threefold law, and it's controversial because everyone interprets this in different ways. Some people interpret this to mean that those who seek ill deserve ill. Those who would seek to cause harm deserve to be harmed, and it is the obligation of a witch to respond to their crap with crap, okay? So they, it's the responsibility of the witch to mirror bad intentions back on those who had those intentions. Many people interpret the threefold law and the Wiccan read to mean that, that we are meant to be keepers of justice as those with power. It is our obligation to protect those without that power, and we should be prepared to harm people, curse people if they need to be taken down. Some people uh, believe that also applies to blessings. You receive blessings, you pass it on times three, and that's kind of in line with the original way of looking at karma. Uh, that comes out of like more Eastern traditions. And, uh, and some people will point to like Joan of Arc, the great seer and say, look at this, you know, look at this woman who smote people and, and did God's will on the universe. And, uh, and was she not righteous in her actions? And, um, and that's where they'll get inspiration from for, uh, for that mindset. Now, I wanted to just read this uh, excerpt. It's on my book on page 71 of the paperback. Um, you can also find this in the High Magic's Aid book 
that Gerald Gardner wrote, and it's an excerpt from that. It says, learn in witchcraft, thou must ever return triple. As I scourged thee, so thou must scourge me. But triple, where I gave thee three strokes, give nine. Where seven, give 21. Where nine, give 27. Where 21, give 63. For this is the joke in witchcraft. The witch knows, though the initiate does not, that she will get three times what she gave. So she does not strike hard. And many interpret that to mean the interpretation I just gave. But many interpret that to mean that a witch ought to refrain from harming others, knowing that she will get three times in return what she gives out, and that she should try to cause as little harm as possible, even when acting in a way that is meant to be harmful. Uh, and so Gandalf, I quote here on the slides, would say it like, even the very wise cannot see all ends, right? So there are reasons why uh, people do what they do that are beyond our own understanding. It isn't for us to judge them. If they are doing something that is objectively hurtful to some person, we are defending innocence, we are protecting people. Uh, we should try to do it in a way that benefits all of the parties, even the perpetuator of the violence or the harm, because keep in mind that even those who perpetuate harm are often themselves victims. Whatever you decide when it comes to a moral code or a moral understanding of this is for you, and then you should abide by that. Because what you don't want is to generate insecurity and guilt and unhappiness in yourself. You have to live in tune with yourself and the world around you. Reincarnation is a very popular theme in any world religions. Um, you find it in Judaism, you find it in Hinduism, you find it all over. Um, it is, there is a Wiccan take uh, here that talks about um, humans are a concentration of life energy, deity is the abstraction, um, and in that way, anything that is capable of sustaining concentrated conscious life can be a vessel for any soul. So Wiccans are not specious, and we do believe that humans can reincarnate as animals. However, uh, we believe that it's a choice, that you choose who you are, where you are, what limitations you're gonna have. You choose which of these lives you would like to be born into, and you make that choice based on a higher agenda, right? Do I serve a purpose greater than mine? Am I helping other people learn lessons? Or am I here to learn my own lessons? That's usually younger versus older souls. Um, you know, if you choose to suffer in this life, it's usually because you can handle it. It's you, you knew what you're getting yourself into and you knew you could rise above it. There is a way out. You just have to keep trying until you find the way to be at peace with yourself. That is a Wiccan mentality. You seek and you seek and you seek and you never stop seeking. Um, the closer you are to enlightenment or like release nirvana, this concept of like not having to reincarnate, of being free of this endless cycle. Many call it the other world, summerland, heaven, the Garden of Eden, <laughs> call it whatever you want, higher planes. The closer you are to achieving that, usually the harder your life is in this lifetime because you are learning the hardest lessons of all generally. Uh, usually you are often responsible for the lives of many other beings. Uh, and that is the nature of a person who is just capable uh, because they're close to release and, and they're close to being done with the cycle for their own souls. And they're here you know, for other purposes still. So what is in a soul, right? We did some metaphysics last time. We talked about souls. We defined souls. Go watch the previous lecture. But think about it. If death is a timeless consciousness uh, and it's beyond any one timeline, it's an ocean uh, or a river of many souls taken as one. So then how much time do we spend between lifetimes? No time. No time at all. It's a, it's a meaningless question. <laughs> time is not passing for us in between lifetimes. We are outside of time. So the question does not make sense. <laughs> Faster than time passes, you are reborn. You can be born into the same timeline. Uh, many people 
would say that their familiars are really them come back to support them <laughs> in this life and that they are like twin flames. That's what a twin flame is. It's when uh, there's two soul, uh, the same soul in two bodies because they reincarnated at the same time. Your twin flame is not always your soulmate. Okay, <laughs> keep that in mind. I do a whole, I do a whole chat on that. So in your last life, when it's when you're, you're all done, you're going to be released from the cycle of reincarnation. Uh, that is when you have a, an ascended awareness. It's called. So it's you know it's one of those things where it's like in Wicca we just don't think that much about the end of about the end game. As S. J. Tucker sings in her uh, a Cheshire Kitten song, you know she says. Um, uh, you can't forsake the journey for the safety of your room until you learn your lessons well. So don't even bother to, to dwell on death and discomfort and suffering. Face it, rise above it, and experience life. That's what you're here to do. You'll die one day anyway. There's no sense fretting over that. Just live as long as you have the luxury to live. That is the Wiccan philosophy and what I'm trying to get and convey and all of the things coming to your head for this lecture. So I hope you learn that and that you think and feel like a Wiccan witch and that this helps you uh, be authentically Wiccan in, in spite of your journey being solitary, I presume, if you're finding me on this channel. The homework for this class, if you're following along in the course, and these are all up in the classroom as well, um, is uh, the questions from chapter two. Actually, I may have to still put them in the classroom. I'll do that right after I get this uh, uh, video edited. But um, I had to record this video twice. The first one was way better. I'm sorry, I lost the <laughs> I lost the recording from my phone. But I got these new mics, so let's see how the audio sounds. Maybe it's better this way. The homework, chapter two, mostly it's just questions. Uh, the exercise number two is a really easy one. Um, I'd say focus on the questions, focus on learning the philosophy, take a break from meditating to do that, and then go back into the meditating. I mean, still meditate if you're forming like a routine with it, but otherwise, I mean, I'd say uh, try to learn these truths, the Wiccan, the authentic Wiccan, go review some of the further reading and all this stuff. Read the quotes, especially if you're reading my book. The quotes, other people's words are way more important than mine. <laughs> Please go and read the further readings. It's very important to having an authentic understanding. And, uh, and it's uh, chapter two, pages 48 through um, 74. Uh, and then next lecture, we're just going to hone in on the wheel of the year. And I think that will take a whole lecture. So, um, so that's why we're doing it this way. But that's the Wiccan philosophy. That's the Wiccan set of beliefs. And if you believe... You know, duotheism, Lord and Lady, ebb and flow, back and forth, cycles. If you find these themes in your existence, then you are a Wiccan witch. Hail and welcome. So thank you for watching. Thank you for working on yourselves. I hope this helps you. Take what serves you and leave the rest. And from everyone here at the Coven of the Open Mind, blessed be.